We're talking about how the shadow of Iraq is hovering over the situation in Syria. Still with us is Richard Wolf, the executive editor at MSNBC.com. Joining us, we have Heather Hurlbert. She's the executive director of the progressive group, the National Security Network, a former State Department speechwriter under President Bill Clinton. We also have Josh Rogan, senior correspondent for national security and politics at Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And Hillary Mann Leverett, a former diplomat and official on Middle East issues under President George W. Bush, now at American University. Um, so, uh, yeah, Heather, I'll start with you. Um, I, you know, I sort of set it up there, you know, but before the uh, before the segment. But everybody has Iraq on their minds in some way. The, the experience, the example of Iraq, and I know we can say there are there are a lot of distinctions between what's being proposed here, what's on the table here. But but how much should Iraq be fo be be you know part of people's thinking on this? You know. The main difference I would say people should have in mind is that the vote that Congress took on Iraq um, after the 9-11 attacks was the culmination of almost a decade of efforts to push us into war with Iraq exactly, by the way, because the 91 war was limited. So in, in Iraq, by the time we get to the place that the American people and the British people are quite rightly thinking about, there had been a lot of groundwork laid and a lot of back and forth in American politics and a lot of, of really landmines laid in American politics, whereas with Syria, what's happening right now is, I'm afraid, just the beginning of what's going to be a much longer story as the U.S. struggles with the chemical weapons, the humanitarian, the regional implications, implications for Israel, implications for Iran's nuclear program. We're going to be, we're going to be having this conversation for, for a decade, and, you know, arguably, the question is, what can we get right now? What landmines can we avoid laying for ourselves in the future? Well, and it's, you know, I, I go back and forth, Josh, with, with, with how to think about this because I, we have the exa some examples at least from the 1990s of these you know humanitarian interventions that were limited in scope and that that you know bore successful outcomes um, I, I wonder at a, at a basic level do you, do you think we would not be having this debate this would not be going to Congress right now um, this wouldn't be as contentious a, a, as it's become politically if it hadn't been for Iraq would we be looking at this much more as like well this is an extension of Kosovo this is an extension of Bosnia this is just another airstrike for humanitarian purposes right I think in one way we're seeing a return to what we see what we saw in the Clinton administration is cruise missile diplomacy, right? This is where we use limited military action to achieve short-term limited uh, diplomatic gains without a real uh, sense of what's really going to be happening afterwards. I mean, the bi biggest difference between the Iraq war and the Syria war is that the Iraq war, we were proposing an invasion, an occupation, and a rebuilding of a country, which is a gargantuan proposal. Here, President Obama is proposing two days of strikes, right? So there's a scale issue, but there's also an intention issue. Uh, th there's nobody who thinks that President Obama is eager to intervene in Syria, right? He spent the last two and a half years avoiding military intervention in Syria. He feels like he's being dragged into it, and now he's going around the world making a case for a, a limited intervention he's really not a fan of and really doesn't really want to do in his heart of hearts, or at least we're led to believe he's conflicted on it. Uh, so, you know, it's not a model for anything, because what we've seen with President Obama is that he was against the Iraq war. Then when it came to Libya, he decided in that one case we should have a responsibility to protect civilians in need, and so that it was worthy of an intervention. And in this case, he's not even making the argument that we're going in to protect civilians, he's making the argument that we should go in to protect this international norm of uh, prohibition on the use of chemical weapons. So there is no pattern in the mind of Barack Obama. He does these things ad hoc, he takes them case by case, and in a sense we can't really connect this decision to the other decisions because he's not connecting them. It is strikingly similar to the lead up to the war in Iraq. I was in the Bush administration, in the Bush White House, dealing also with congressional Democrats and with members of the media, with the New York Times, with, with NBC. The herd mentality that took over to buy into the Bush administration's narrative that Saddam Hussein had to have chemical weapons and weapons of mass destruction, he was determined to use them against us, was something unquestioned. I remember going with a key member of the Bush national security team to see President and Clinton, and he putting his arm around her, telling her not only was the intel right, but she was doing the right thing morally. It was mis not only a mistake, it was based on manufactured evidence. Here, nobody is asking this basic question, except for our friends in Moscow, what if Assad didn't order this? What if this wasn't a Syrian troop chemical attack? What if this was perpetrated by Al-Qaeda affiliated oppositionists? The consequences here for going into Syria are even more grave than Iraq. Because if we go into Syria and we degrade and we weaken Assad to the extent that Jabhat al-Nusra and the other Al-Qaeda affiliated oppositionists get away with mass chemical warfare, if that's what happens,
happened and we think they're going to stop there, that's the definition of insanity. When, when you now that's because uh, I I've heard people advance that that you know scenario I guess that this was not actually Assad who who ordered this this attack. Maybe it was other elements of the military that he didn't directly control. You're saying maybe it was or the like Al Qaeda. Al -Qaeda. Well, Russia what has, would be what would be the what would be the ex John Kerry put a lot of evidence on the table the other no, day. No, compared to Colin Powell, it's a joke. Okay, but what, so what would be the evidence for what you're suggesting? What is what is the available Russian, evidence for the what you're suggesting? Russian the Russian the Russians and the Chinese have people on the ground. They didn't pull their diplomats out. They haven't pulled their people out of out of Syria. They went to the last chemical weapons attack site in March, and they did forensics on the ground themselves, and they found two striking things that have not been covered in the press here at all. One was that the rockets used to deliver those chemicals were homemade rockets, not military, not industrial produced. The other thing they found was the sarin there was also not military, industrial produced. They didn't use stabilizers. Now, maybe this is totally different. Maybe this time Assad said, well, you know, I'm winning on the battlefield, so I'm just going to I'm just going to send chemical weapons in for that for the heck of it, for the fun of it. Maybe, but maybe the Russians have a point. And here Obama is going to go to Russia and we think he's not going to hear an earful. The rest of the world does not believe what we're saying for good reason. We made it up last time. All right, Josh, what do you? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm not one of those people who thinks that, you know, all the rebels are good or all the rebels are bad or all the regime people are good or all the regime people are bad. But there are there is a bunch of evidence here that I think we should just put into the discussion here, especially those uh, march attacks that uh, Hillary mentioned. Uh, there were signals intelligence. We caught Syrian military uh, commanders talking about the use of weapons. As we did with weapons. Iraq. And, you know, we interrogated no. those Iraqis yeah. after the fact, after we invaded Iraq, we interrogated the Iraqis that were on the SIG end that Colin Powell displayed to the world. And you know what those Iraqis said? They couldn't believe how much we had contorted, distorted, and taken out of context what they were saying on the phone. That's not how Syrians, I've, I spent over a decade in the U.S. government. That is not how Syrians do their battle plan is on the phone. Right, so it may be, we, should, we should also look, take a look at this here. attack here in, in Gauta, right? This was a, a, a rebel-controlled area that was a key uh, venue for how the rebels got arms into Syria th uh, through Jordan. It was a, 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 a long desire of the Assad regime to take over these neighborhoods. Uh, they saw it as a necessary strategic objective. They set up military on the outside of Ghouta. After the chemical attack, they went in and bombarded and attempted to retake the city. So it doesn't really make a lot of logical sense that this was a rebel attack on the rebels to make it easier for the Assad regime to take over. Except I mean, they're it doesn't the only really ones who have follow. a motive for U.S. intervention. But, you know, but, Do you uh, think Assad wants U.S. intervention? They're the, they're the only ones who have a motive. I don't know. You don't know either. And that's why this needs to be debated in Congress. The American people yeah, need to Congress really debate whether so we're going to invade yet another Muslim country and potentially no, no, kill Hillary, millions Hillary, of well, people. They're, well, they're not, nobody's talking about invasion. It's not invasion. Just for a second. Nobody's yeah, talking about invasion. Strikes. It's like also, we did in Sudan no, when we took Hillary, out a pharmaceutical Hillary, plant. Hillary, Hillary, you just had a lot of time to talk. Just hold on one second. You say that nobody questioned the evidence when it came to Iraq. So while we're having the whole Iraq discussion, there were plenty of questions that were being asked. The reason the administration, which you were part of, said that they we ha that you couldn't wait for the smoking gun to be a mushroom cloud was because people were asking questions to say that this is exactly a repeat isn't actually the case, you know very well. There are real warning signs, there are real lessons people should draw from Iraq. But in this case, nobody's disputing that chemical weapons were actually used. In Iraq's case, there was a question whether there were chemical weapons collections, whether they had degraded, whether they were actually usable, whether there was an imminent threat. In this case, there's no imminent threat. No threat to the United States directly, and chemical weapons have been used. You say it's ad hoc, Josh. All of these situations are ad hoc. Just because it involves an Arab country and weapons of mass destruction, that's about where the similarity ends. Well, this is closer yeah. to Bosnia was, and Kosovo I than the way I wasn't a political appointee in the Bush administration. You neglected to mention in your intro that I was also a professional member of the Clinton National Security Council staff when they bombed a pharmaceutical plant in Sudan. Again, without evidence. This is not something that is unique to Bush, so, unique to Clinton, or even to Obama. This is coming back to your, your point in the setup. The 1991 intervention in Iraq to get Iraqi troops out of Kuwait that we thought was so clean that we took such, we patted ourselves on the back and had big parades. Osama bin Laden goes back, to, went back to that. Al-Qaeda's writings go back to that. The U.S. decision taken under Clinton with very little thought to keep tens of thousands of U.S. troops in Saudi Arabia and to continuously bomb Iraq, then to bomb Sudan, to bomb other places. These are not clean interventions. We so desperately the, need the to think about that. But, but, but it does, uh, again, it does get back to the more basic question here of 
you say we talk about evidence of specifically of the chemical weapons. We also have evidence of 100,000 people being killed over the last two years of unspeakable brutality being perpetrated by this regime in so Syria. So let's do serious diplomacy. S President Clinton has had over two years to engage in serious diplomacy. You, you have a serious foreign President minister in Russia diplomacy. with Lavrov. You have a serious foreign minister in Iran. You have a serious foreign minister in China. All of these people have put proposal after proposal. You have Lakhdar Brahimi, who I worked with on Afghanistan, who did this in Somalia, who did this in Haiti, who did this in Iraq. You have serious people there, but the Obama administration administration has said time and time again, no, Assad just has to well, Heather, well, Heather, yeah. Heather so, let, let me get to that issue then. Let's take the, the diplomat. Has there, have we not tried dipl a diplomatic approach to Syria? So there is no question the administration has tried hard, has had multiple conferences, worked very hard to pull the, admin the op Syrian opposition together to have a credible Syrian opposition that excluded the extremist That's not elements diplomacy. Um, that Hillary rightly is concerned about, has worked with the Russians, has worked with our allies. Now, there is also no question that this administration said, because of Iraq, we don't want to put so much effort into Syria to the exclusion of other things. And I think looking at where we are now, we all maybe wish, I certainly do, that they had tried harder. But that the biggest lessons of Iraq and of exactly your setup is, first of all, we don't want to even get pulled into anything that looks like a quagmire, which led us maybe to be more standoffish than we should have. And second, to this little fight we were having before, there is no longer any standoff standard of evidence that you can present that people will believe. And we could go on arguing, you know, until everybody watching us was through with brunch and on to lunch. And there is no longer any place that civilized Americans and members of the international con community can agree about what so we see. Right, wait, 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 wait. We're gonna, we're gonna, we are going to take, take a break here, and Josh is going to get in when we come back. We have a bit of uh, breaking news here, I guess you could call it. Just moments ago on Meet the Press, Secretary of State John Kerry revealed that the United States now has evidence of sarin gas use in Syria, adding the, quote, case is building for a military attack. I think we have sound of that. Let's play it. Let me just add this morning a very important recent development that in the last 24 hours we have learned uh, through samples that were provided to the United States and that have now been tested from first responders in East Damascus and hair samples and blood samples have tested positive for signatures of sarin. So this case is building and this case will build. And, and, and we, Josh, we just started to pick this up in, in, in the last you know, segment. I think everything that John Kerry says in terms of evidence, in terms of building the case, is being measured by a lot of people against Colin Powell, United Nations, you know, 2003, 10 years ago. Um, how, do you, right. how do you factor that? So just to pick up where we, where, when we left off, I mean, I think one big difference here is that the Bush administration clearly was making the case for a war, and the Obama administration is making the case for a mild punishment followed by a return to the diplomatic track. Let's remember that the policy here is to go through a Geneva process with the Russians and the Assad regime and the opposition for a political solution. They haven't abandoned that. In fact, they keep saying that after this two-day strike or whatever it is, uh, that they're going to go back to the negotiating table. Now, you can say that that's not genuine or that's, that their diplomacy hasn't been successful or that that's not realistic, and those are all arguments that people can make, but that is the policy, and that's a huge difference. They're not trying to, uh, the Obama administration is strenuously trying to avoid uh, getting entangled. Well, that's, that, that, that is one of, that is one of the, but, 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 but uh, that is one of the, Hillary, one of the things that, that sort of just bothers me a little bit about this, I guess, is that in a sense that we are rightfully so concerned about not having another Iraq, not repeating another Iraq, that if we believe what, what's been put out there in terms of this will be a surgical, precise, very mm -hmm. limited attack, then it could almost do so little. The effect could be so limited and so benign or that it leaves Look, Assad in power and it lets Assad Assad. say he's, he's stronger because of this. People also patted themselves over the back over Libya. You know, we got rid of Gaddafi. We actually were decisive. We changed the balance of power in Libya and we got a dead ambassador. People don't ask the important questions. They don't think about the consequences. And it comes back to some basic concepts of but international but law. But but President Obama said he would uphold when he came in. You know, I want my money back that I gave to that man. I want my money back. He does not have a responsibility to punish. The United States has no responsibility to punish. No respons you can argue on, responsibility Hillary, hang to on, protect. Hang, hang on. You can argue as a progressive responsibility to protect, but the U.S. has no basis in American law or international law a responsibility to but punish. But there is, no, but there, is no, there is no responsibility to punish when somebody uses chemical weapons no, against, there's not. against civilians. There's not. There's, there's no, not. But there's, you know there's, responsibility. There's, there's not even precedent. There's responsibility to protect. Is. What you do is you do a fact-finding mission, and what Kerry has done today should be called for what it is. It's another kind of curveball putting it out there on the table. Why doesn't he wait for the U.N. to do a thorough investigation? 
investigation. Why did the Bush administration? But Hillary, if the, if, the, if the United Nations, which the inspectors left, I think, 24 hours ago, right. they have a report that's going to be due. If that report comes out and confirms what the United States has said, that there is evidence that the Syrian government, that the government of Bashar Assad, right. has used chemical weapons on its own civilians, do you then accept the then evidence? what international do, law do you, says... Would you well, then, but would you then, because you have, you have yeah, expressed have your no clear basis. skepticism... Yeah, I, have no, I have no reason to doubt it. I didn't think that my president under President Bush would lie to me either. I have no basis to doubt my government, except that it's now happened before. But, the, so but again, but you, you talk, but you, I'm sorry, but Hillary, hang on, Hillary, I'm just trying, I'm trying to clarify this point mm -hmm. here, because you said that you, you said, let's let the United States, United Nations go in and have an investigation. Right. The United Nations was there, right. conducted an investigation, right. and a report is due, and I'm asking right. you, will you accept that report if that report says chemical weapons were used by the government of Assad against his own people, will you accept the legitimacy of that report and say that is evidence, and I accept that? Of course, and I also accept what Carla Del Ponte, one of the investigators, has already said about the prior attacks, that it was the opposition. Well, I have no reason to doubt these people. I have no reason to doubt these people. But the point is that even if it's used, and I certainly will accept evidence that is presented impartially that's been vetted, of course I would. There's no reason to doubt it. But the key is then what do you do after the fact? The United States always thinks and has thought this since the end of the Cold War that we can just go in and kill somebody. Well, that's getting less and less viable to do, and it's not international law. What happens is even if the Assad government used chemical weapons here, what international law calls for for a reason, because this would actually protect civilians and human life, is that you present the evidence to the government. You give them a response, you give them an opportunity to respond, and then you work with them so they don't do it again. Okay, so, Richard. Um, let's just leave the evidence question aside. It's an important one, but it's all very hard to assess for members of Congress and everybody else. What are the common threads between Iraq and Libya and this situation? And even one of the debates about Bosnia and Kosovo is this measure. Can we do this? Is it easy or not? And the reason we engaged uh, in Libya, the reason actually the Bush administration thought it was so eager to go into Iraq was because they thought it was easy. The reason they have been reluctant about Syria is because they think it's extremely difficult. The people advocating to it, whether they're on the hawkish side or the humanitarians inside the White House, inside the administration, have been reluctant because they think it's very, very difficult to execute. Syrian air defenses are robust and extremely difficult difficult to overcome without loss of life, American loss of life. So that is an important measure here. This president isn't just talking about proliferation. He wants it to be limited because it's so difficult to execute. Why, 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 Hillary, why, Hillary, hang on. Hillary, that, Hillary, that, Hillary, that, that, Hillary, 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 I want to get Heather in here because I want to I get this question to Heather because I, I raised it a minute ago, but what Richard just says, given how difficult and complex the situation and, and given how limited the operation would be if the operation takes place, what happens if it really doesn't change the equation at all, if it doesn't change Assad's thinking if it doesn't stop him from launching chemical attacks, what happens then? Well, we've been pretty explicit, actually, that it's not going to change the situation in the near term. And in another way, it already has changed the equation. For example, Assad, Assad isn't using the phone to talk to his, his generals anymore. The whole way they were conducting themselves, they now know we can hear. So the day-to-day -day operations have changed. No, no, no. The last week, they've been spending time moving prisoners around, moving equipment around, moving weapons around. Assad's comfort level with how he can behave in his own country will never be the same. So at one level, we have already changed things on the ground. Second, and I think the American people need to know this, and it needs to be an important part of the conversation, because Syria is so difficult, because the situation there is so terrible, and because it affects us, because of the weapons of mass destruction, because of our allies Israel and Turkey, because of the threat of spillover in Jordan and Lebanon, this is going to go on, and the U.S. is going to keep being involved. So we shouldn't delude ourselves that whether we vote up or down, whether there are two days of cruise missile strikes, this is going to go on mm -hmm. for years. And the best outcome is that we have a political process that contains the violence, that diminishes the threat to civilians, that contains the role extremists can play. But Americans need to understand this isn't something we can isolate ourselves from and pretend isn't happening. Okay. And, and this is going to go on because I'm sure there will be a lot more to talk about in the days and weeks ahead on this show and others. But for now, I want to thank MSNBC's Richard Wolf, Heather Herbert of the National Security Network, Josh Rogan of Newsweek and the Daily Beast, and Hillary Mann Leverett of American University.